I have uh, avocado plants. I've got about eight of them. Uh, they're small miniature dwarf trees. And uh, if you know anything about avocados, you'll find that avocados do not like salt buildup. So I'm really careful about what I feed those avocados. And if I think I'm getting a little, I look at the leaves of my avocado plants and if I see any kind of curl or any kind of activity that looks like it's not right, the proper growth for that avocado, <coughs> I will add Epsom salt and that will just cure it, whatever, uh, whatever it has. It's a pretty, uh, pretty good thing to use. Growing pouches and bags. Now, at first when I saw this, I thought, now that's the craziest thing I've ever seen. But there is actually a place for it. The, the idea behind it is that it's porous. It can breathe. You know, a pot can't breathe. Your average plastic pot that you'll get, that thing's not going to breathe except maybe the holes you have in the bottom. But so this is not a bad idea. Sometimes they'll use it in a hydroponic application where they'll flood a little tray with water and it just seeps right in and then they'll let the water out and it goes right out. So it's actually a really good way of oxygenating your root mass and they say there's a lot of good features uh, to this. They have carrying handles and uh, most of these pots have a three to four year lifespan. It boosts plant growth and yields. Uh, the fabric allows roots to breathe and it prevents roots from circling. And it allows water to drain properly. So there's a little more to it than meets the eye in the beginning. And there's different varieties as you can see. Um, Pots are washable and last for many seasons. Keep the, these containers keep plants warmer in winter and cooler in the summer. The pots allow plants to be placed outside quicker and they can be used with drip systems, overheads, and hydroponic flood trays. Sizes five gallon and up have handles and best of all, these are usually cheaper than regular plastic pots. Um, plastic pots can be a little expensive, not too bad. Now, write this down. Greenhouse Megastore. That's where I buy all my plastic pots. Greenhouse Megastore has the cheapest prices in, in five gallon or better containers or three and a half gallon. And they're really good quality. I use them year after year. Is that in Asheville? No, they're online. Online. GreenhouseMegastore.com. I'm sorry, I should have been clearer about that. Tomato is king. You know, if there is any king of the vegetables, it's the tomato. A lot of times when I see uh, people that have a potted plant out on their porch, it'll be a tomato or a pepper. But most of the time, tomatoes. Tomatoes like good soil and getting the watering just right is one key to success in preventing blossom end rot. A lot of gardeners will look at a tomato plant and they'll say, I've got blossom end rot, my plant is not getting calcium. So they'll quickly add a Tums or they'll add calcium to it and they, don't, they fail to realize that they're not watering that tomato plant properly. Tomato plants are very finicky in the way they want to be watered. They don't want to be deluged with water. They want to be watered every day consistently with just enough water. Now that's through the summer. Um, when you get on either side of the summer, the fall or the spring, they don't have to be watered every day. They don't want to be wet. They want to be moist and then they want to just dry out a little bit and then you water them again. So you have to be really careful and that watering, proper watering on a tomato plant is what will prevent blossom end rot more than anything. It's not adding calcium. That's a fallacy that's taught widely that is not true about tomatoes. Now, it is true, a tomato may not be, you may not have enough calcium in your soil, but if you're using my recipe, you won't have that problem. Or if you add calfos to your soil, you won't have that problem. A tomato plant will grow year after year if given the right growing conditions. Cut back a determinate variety to get another yield. You know, a lot of folks don't know this, that tomatoes, they'll grow forever if you take care of them properly. If you give them the amount of heat they need 
and they don't get blasted with winter. If you were to bring them inside, if you have a north-facing exposure like in your kitchen or a living room or something or a solarium, a sunroom, uh, you can bring that tomato plant in. What you do is you cut it back. You know, I may cut that thing that high. That's all right. It won't hurt a bit. And it'll grow slowly over the winter and then I'll bring it back outside and that thing will turn into a monster. I'm going to show you a monster tomato plant in a few minutes. But uh, determinants, there's two different kind of tomato plants. There's indeterminate, which is a vine type of tomato. And those things will keep producing tomatoes forever. They're like the sandwich tomatoes, uh, the big beef, the better boys, all, there's a whole host of them. Um, the, uh, the Roma tomatoes, the Viva Italia tomatoes, any type of Roma tomato, um, those things are mostly determinate. And if you want to get another yield, a good secret is you cut that after it's produced once, a lot of times they die off. But if you cut that thing way back and only li leave like two nodes, and then let your best node grow and then cut and leave one node, it'll grow back up and it'll produce again for you. Blight is a real problem in this area. The summers are rainy and hot. How many of you don't know that? <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, you know, my wife and I haven't been here that long. This is going on our third year. Um, I don't know if this is the way it is every year here, but I'm planning on it being this way. It pretty much doesn't dry out during the, the early summer months at least. Um, anyway, these are real favorable conditions for blight. Members of the nightshade family include tomato, potato, pepper, and eggplant. These also may be infected at any age by the fungi that cause fusarium wilt and verticulum wilt. Now what that is, I noticed in my garden one year that my peppers were just shriveling up and dying in the ground. And I couldn't figure it out. I thought, okay, they're not getting enough water. So I watered and watered and I checked the water to make sure I wasn't giving them too much water because sometimes you can have a, you know, drainage is really important for your garden. If you're putting in a garden and it doesn't drain well, you're going to kill some plants. But uh, I checked my garden for the drainage and the drainage was okay and I couldn't figure out. I watched one after the other. I lost a whole row, first one row, and then half of another row. And I was a little distressed because I put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in growing those things. And I didn't want to just up and die on me like that. So um, I didn't realize what it was until I did some study on the subject and found out that there's a spore <laughs> that lives. And what it does, it blocks, it lives in the soil for several years. And that's what this is, Fusarium wilt and it blocks the uptake of the plant to take water. The plant can't take water and it just shrivels up and dies. So there's a product that, uh, that I began to be aware of because I asked some of these. I have, uh, I have one friend that has been gardening for 70 years and he used to be really big in this area. He'd make 100,000 a year growing. And he's better, in my opinion, than most of these other farmers around here. He told me what these other farmers make, how much they have into this production they do out here. You see by Ingalls? You know, for an acre of those tomatoes that you see next to Ingalls, those farmers pay $10,000 worth of infrastructure on that plastic and those raised mounds to get that, that going. We'll talk a little more about that because I want to teach you guys a little bit about what the professionals do around here. He told me. He told me everything. And he grows in the ground. He said, I can grow over twice the amount. He said, those farmers are getting 20 tons per acre. And that's all they really care about. How many tons per acre can I get? And he told me, he said, I get 45 tons per acre just by growing it in the ground. But I take really good care of my tomato plants. And one of the ways he does is he sprays this product. It's, uh, he uses a product called Manzate. Now he uses enough of it because he's got like 10 acres. But you'll find in, uh, <coughs> in um, southern states, in Fletcher, if you go to southern states, or I believe Lowe's even sells it, this product here, it's called Mancazeb. And that has the same active ingredients in it that Manzate does. And you spray your tomatoes every week, 
during the rainy time of year and that will prevent you from getting blight. Mm -hmm. Now let me tell you how serious it is with tomato plants. Last year I planted a hundred super tomatoes. They're called Florida 47 and they grow an inch a day. Those things are blockbuster tomato plants and they grow beautiful red tomatoes and they're wonderful. And I lost every one of them. I planted them, they grew up, they grew up, and they got the blight and died. Before I got, I didn't get any tomatoes. Those things didn't hardly even get past flowering. And there was so much blight in the air out here that it just totally killed all of them. Now I had other tomatoes because last year I was putting it to the test. I wanted to be organic in such a way to where I was raising healthy produce. And I didn't want to spray, so I didn't. And so I kept that lesson in mind because last year I had 300 tomato plants and I only got 15% yield. I'm telling you the truth. And the reason I only got 15% yield, we had to buy tomatoes from the local farmers, is because I was such a stickler that I didn't want to spray anything that I lost all my tomato plants. Unfortunately, you have to abide by certain rules. Gardening is a science. You can't go off half cocked and think you're just going to do things any old which way because you're going to lose if you do. And I lost. I lost big last year. I'm not going to lose that way this year because I talked to two professional farmers last week. Um, one of them used to work for the county extension for many years and he grows. I mean, he, he's a professional. And he told me, he said, if you do not use Manzate, you don't have a garden. You have nothing. He said it's a no-brainer. And I, and I realized last year that my experience was right to what he said. I lost everything. I didn't get to eat one of those. Well, I'll take questions. If you could write it down after the class. Are I'll, you saying when they get some we, we don't, we don't take any, any questions until we got a 15-minute section after the class for your questions. Because I just want to get to my certain slide that we can get finished with this portion. Because if we talk all the time, we'll never get finished and you won't get the knowledge. So we'll have plenty of time for questions. <laughs> Respectfully. Potatoes can be grown in bags. Now this is what can be grown in containers. Potatoes can be grown in bags or other containers. And they're best if grown from seed potatoes for disease resistance and robustness. Cucumbers don't like cold, but they're easy to grow. Green beans or runner bees, beans, these guys get thirsty. Not to mention, not only do they get thirsty, but those guys are really powerful plants. I mean, they'll grow up something and they'll get as tall as you and then they'll bush out. And it's incredible. If you don't have them on a good trellis, uh, you'll be having that trellis pulled down, which I had that I had a, a wire that was like this last year because it was so heavy and I'm probably going to do a little better this year. Carrots do well in containers. Uh, they don't mind cold. As a matter of fact, carrots and beets you can grow through the winter and they love it. They're okay. Um, they do insist on well-tilled soil. I had some carrots grown in my garden in my planter boxes. The mine only have about eight inches of soil and once they hit that hard thing, they started growing out. They were the weirdest looking carrots. But they, they were good still. It's just so I learned I have to plant them in the ground and they got to be able to go down as far as they want easily. Beans grow in pots just fine. Don't overdo the nitrogen. Nitrogen uh, is actually fixed in the soil by beans. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of professional gardeners will use a type of bean or legume as a cover crop and those things will fix the nitrogen back into the soil for you uh, to the amount it's like, uh, I don't know, 50, 50 pounds or 100 pounds per acre I believe is what the amount is. But you can't be eating the beans because then that's part of the nitrogen out. That's those farmers that use beans as a cover crop, they till those beans into the soil. And those are typically not green beans that you eat. But beans have that wonderful property where they can take the worst awful soil, which is basically what we have here in North Carolina. We got very poor soil here and it has to be worked properly. Dig in plenty of rotted manure or compost. Peppers and chili, 
these guys are high in vitamin C. The hotter they get, the more vitamin C they contain. They don't like cool temps and their growth can be stunted at around 53 degrees or less. So if you are growing those things in the springtime and they get cooler than 53 degrees, you will most likely never realize the full potential of that plant. Whereas it might grow to here or here, it'll only grow that high half or maybe even a third as I've seen that happen on my own farm. Sweet corn, although it can be grown in containers, it takes up a lot of space for not much yield. It takes huge amounts of nitrogen. Uh, I don't grow corn in pots, even though you can because you're only going to get maybe two ears off of most uh, varieties, so it's not really worth it. But like I say, you can. Now you got a heavy duty feed that thing with nitrogen. Um, ammonium nitrate is generally what they use and only the professional growers can side dress their corn with ammonium nitrate. Uh, they have other products but that's what corn likes. If, if you want a small stunted bit of corn don't do anything to it but if you want your corn to grow high um, you have to side dress that with additional nitrogen. There are some other products you can use urea nitrogen um, but the old time farmers that have been doing it for 70 or 80 years that know what the past was, they use ammonium nitrate. Although you can't get that on the open market. That's only for farmers.